Church, Hillsville, Virginia. Let's continue to worship in song, Living for Jesus. <laughs>
we're going to sing that chorus without music. Okay, Becky, let's go. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for Thee alone. Thank you so much, dear Lord. I'm not exactly sure what's happening next, but... Here's Pastor Ryan to the rescue. <laughs> and on a, on a totally unrelated note, we may be, sorry, on a totally unrelated note, we may be voting on new computer equipment at the next business meeting. Our scripture reading for this morning, and thank you, ladies, that was a, a good save and it was beautiful. It's from Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning with a heavy heart knowing that this is a, a difficult message today that we're going to take a look at, knowing at the same time that there are many within our own congregation that are bearing difficult burdens this morning. Father, I want to begin by lifting them up. And we're not going to go through a litany of names or a litany of problems. Father, you know every single one of them uh, before they even cross our minds, much less pass our lips. But Father, I just pray that your strength would be uplifting those this morning. Father, that your strength would be a comfort to them. That there would be healing in those cases where it is your will. But Father, that, that everyone would cling to you in every case. So Father, we lift those up to you. We lift up those families to you as well. And Father, we pray that they can feel our love and prayers for them as well. And Lord, continue to be with us in our worship. I just pray that this particular message would be one that would unplug people's ears, soften their hearts, uh, would help them to reflect and, and evaluate their own lives, Father. And I just pray that you would bring those who need to hear this message to hear it this morning. Lord, whether they are here in this parking lot, whether they're listening on the radio, whether they're watching it at some point in time, on social, social media or online. Father, I just pray that your words through the Holy Spirit would do the work that I know they can do. So Father, we lift all of this up to you as we now continue to worship. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give a shout out before that music starts, if it does start this morning. I don't know. Can y'all hear me? Okay. I want, to, I want everybody to blow their horn for the canine, the canines over here, the dogs came to worship this morning. So I want to hear y'all blow your horns for them. Can you? <laughs> We're starting a new worship, I presume. This is the dog club over here. And they came to hear, hear us sing and hear the message this morning. And we have a great crowd this morning. I don't think everybody blew their horn that time. Blow it again. <laughs> All right, we're ready to sing in Christ alone. And I know you don't have the words, but you can hum. So hum along. Oh. Bye. 
for Pastor Brian to come forward and give us this message. I just want to say thank you, Lord, for this beautiful weather. As I look out over the mountains this morning, I just thank you, Lord, that I'm here, that I'm here at this church, that I'm here in this town of Hillsville, Virginia, and that I'm surrounded by these just awesome people, Lord. We just thank you so much for this time to come and worship with you and just be with Pastor Ron as he brings us that message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Some, some biblical passages and therefore some messages are hard to deliver because they're hard to understand. Some are difficult for the opposite reason. They're all too easy to understand. This text this morning falls under that category. Jesus speaks very clearly. And it can be a very hard message to hear. But it is so important in our church today. And I know as I speak now it, with the situation that we're in, I'm probably even more aware of the fact that, yes, I am absolutely preaching to you all that are here uh, with us in the parking lot at First Baptist this morning. But we also know that we have people right around here in the community that can hear on the FM broadcast. We have people all over Hillsville that can hear on the AM broadcast. We have people all over the world that can watch online what we're preaching and teaching. 
So there's a whole variety of people in different parts of their walk with Christ that may be tuning in and listening to some of this message this morning. And I'm thankful for that. I'm reminded that self-reflection is always beneficial, no matter where we're at in our walks. But the challenge of a text like ours this morning is that you want to wake up those who are on the wrong road without destroying the assurance of those who are already on the right path. I can tell you a lot of prayer went into this, putting this together this morning. Uh, I, I've prayed to be able to preach this in the power that it deserves, but also with grace. I just want to deliver this message in a way that honors God. So let's, let's jump into it here. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to start this morning in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Paul Washer is, is one of my favorite preachers, and he pulls no punches. Um, that's why I love him. I think he's right when he says that the church today very often teaches a half-truth here. We teach the gate is narrow. Absolutely. We do. We've, we've got it right in the church. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, through walking through that narrow gate, Jesus Christ. And a lot of times for people, they tend to equate that to one day, I said the sinner's prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with the sinner's prayer. People can come to Christ through the sinner's prayer. But it's, it's not a magic formula. And too often, people wind up trusting in a moment instead of trusting in a person. Yes, invite Jesus into your life. But more than that, you give your life to him. You give your life to to him there's more than just the gate and too often in american churches if we were to look out and kind of redefine this passage i think the way that we would say it must be laid out based on what we see in many american churches is that there is a narrow gate and a broad path Enter through the narrow gate onto the broad path. We look around, we see Christians, quotes, Christians all the time, not living a Christian life, not living Jesus' ethic. They're on the broad road, but they'll tell you they went through the narrow gate. We can't forget the path that follows the gate, that walk and that lifestyle that Jesus has been telling, about, telling us about on the service Sermon on the Mount for the last year of my preaching, through the last seven chapters. Jesus gives us, and there's going to be a series of them in this passage, he gives us only two choices. That's it, two choices. The narrow gate and the hard way, that's option one. Or the wide gate and the easy way. The default path for every single person in this world is to be walking on the broad road. By default, that's where every single one of us was walking. And we've got to exit through the narrow gate and onto the narrow way if we are going to avoid destruction. It's what this passage teaches. I grew up in Atlanta, south side of Atlanta, Peachtree City. We called it the bubble. Um, it was a very safe place to raise kids back then. That's why we called it the bubble. But I grew up learning how to drive in Atlanta traffic. I remember watching some YouTube videos and reading some things about the interstate traffic. Uh, one group from Georgia Tech, a group of students at Georgia Tech, did an experiment where they jumped on I-285, which is the perimeter that goes all the way around Atlanta. It's a big circle. 
There was a, a baseball player for the Braves in the 1980s that hopped on it and forgot to get off and missed a game. He was not very bright. I-285, they got on I-285. I-285 has a 55 mile an hour speed limit. And what they did was they got a line of traffic, the, the four or five of them, each got in a car and got in a lane and did 55 miles an hour and recorded it. And what you saw was a whole bunch of the rest of Atlanta stacked up behind them, cursing, throwing things at them, jumping around them in the medians to get past them. They were furious, furious. You take that same mentality and move into the middle of town where I-75 and I-85 come together. There's times where it feels like it's about 16 lanes wide. I think it actually is if you take a look at it. And what you see is when you're moving in traffic, it is really hard to change lanes. It's really hard to get off at an exit over here unless you've been trying to get over and work your way there for the last three miles. Nobody wants to let you over. Everybody else wants you to keep moving so they can keep moving. It's really hard to go against the grain. Our sin natures want us to stay on the broad road. That's what it fights for. This is the easy way. Go with the flow. Look like the world. Our sin natures want us running full speed down the highway to hell. And on this, this highway and this narrow road, there's no straddling them. There's no going back and forth. You are on the narrow road or you are on the broad path, one or the other. The path to eternal life is narrow because it only needs to be wide enough for one person to walk, Jesus we walk in his footsteps or we are not on his path. It goes on in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So often because of our sin natures, we want to remake the narrow path to look like the broad road. We're drawn back to that familiarity and ease. And so we're attracted to those people who motion us back onto that highway, oftentimes in very subtle ways. You know, they use enough God talk and religious words to sound like they've got it all figured out. And when that gets coupled with throwing in a few ideas that appeal to what we want, then we can be enticed to look past what God has really said. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus has told us the only way to life is to enter through him, the narrow gate, and to walk the narrow path that he has laid out for us to follow. So, recognizing and identifying that true path is crucial for us. You know, one of the, the serious parts of my job as a pastor is to protect the flock from wolves. We do that by upholding doctrine. A lot of times you start throwing the word doctrine out. Man, that sounds dry and boring and nobody wants to talk about it. But doctrine is important. It's really important. You know, if I was to come to you and say, hey, man, you know my friend Bob? And you say, oh, yeah, I know Bob. 
And I started telling you about Bob and how it was awesome. Yeah, I saw Bob the other day, and Bob was actually bench pressing 400 pounds. And that all makes sense, because if you guys know my buddy Bob, Bob's six foot three. He's about 250, chiseled. But if the Bob you were thinking of in your head was five feet tall and 400 pounds, we're not talking about the same Bob. That's a different Bob, even though they're both called Bob. How much more important is it when the character of God, who God is, points us to how we're to live on this path? Doctrine reveals God's character. We're told, beware of false teaching within the church. That's the sheep's clothing part. You think about it, if you were Satan and you wanted to try to steer as many people off the path as possible, you wouldn't start trying to entice them by going way over here with what you were trying to teach them. No, you'd take just a couple of, couple of short steps onto that shoulder, enough little God talk and buzzwords, and then mix in some other stuff. And we see this all over what passes for the Christian church, especially in this country today. I can give you example after example after example. I had a recent devotional. I use a, a Bible app on my phone, which is normally great. But I remember getting a devotional that I read through, and I did it just in the hopes that they would correct themselves or make some sense out of it. This is a mainstream teaching, but the teaching was essentially, you can be a Christian how you want to be. You don't have to worry about what God tells you about how to be a Christian. And then we've got stuff we talk about all the time. Joel Osteen, the prosperity gospel. This is a gospel with no sin, and a gospel with no sin is no gospel at all. Sadly, I'm learning some things about churches like Hillsong. We know Hillsong from some of the contemporary music, which is good. And, and I hate the fact that I'm having to reconsider using them now. They, their music, there's nothing wrong with their music, but their church has some almost cultish practices like anointing residue. That one of their leaders, they believe, has been anointed and there's a residue. He's dead. But their new leaders can go lay on top of his grave and kind of soak up that anointing. That's straight out of the occult. That's not Christian. And then on top of that, we can just look around at a lot of the mainline churches and you know they are trying to conform God and his word to what the world wants rather than conforming themselves to the image of Christ that he's given us. They're trying to make the narrow path look like the broad road. In the end, this is why doctrine is so important. It's the same as those two bobs. You can use the same words and you can call things by the same names, but if they are fundamentally different, then they are not the same. Another great illustration of this is in world religions. A lot of times, Muslims will say, we worship the same God you do. We have the lineage of Abraham to play off of. It's the same God the Father. Called by the same name. From the same lineage. But when you start to look at doctrine of who God is, we believe in a God who wants us to have assurance of our salvation. Who is intimately involved in our lives and who loves us. The Muslim view of God, number one, doesn't include Jesus Christ as the Trinity, and that's a pretty big one right there. But God the Father himself is dispassionate. He's unconnected. He doesn't take an intimate, personal, loving part in your life. Not only that, if you do all the things that they say you're supposed to do, you might get into heaven if God feels good about it that day. There's no assurance. When you have so many different things that are different about the person you're trying to describe, at some point, you're not describing the same person. And that's what happens there. 
You can say you worship God or follow Jesus. We get that out of our politicians all the time. But if someone has given them characteristics other than what God's word has described, what he has revealed to mankind about himself, then they are no longer the same thing. It's such a big warning for us to keep in mind. And whenever you start talking like this, and you start questioning people's thoughts and beliefs, you'll always get things like, well, you can't judge a book by its cover. Okay. Well, this is telling us that we need to evaluate leaders and what they're teaching. So what are we to do? How are we to know? Jesus tells us, here's the test. You will know them by their fruit. There's an evidence of the quality of their character that we can look at. Here, it's in reference to false prophets, but the same can be said for evaluating any Christian. You'll also hear, well, I know I've done this and I've done this, but you don't know my heart. I don't have to. Again, there's only two choices, bad fruit and good fruit. Bad fruit, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious, Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then good fruit in verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If you read the Apostle John's works, he talks a lot about the idea of our walk with Christ. We either walk in light or we walk in darkness. We're not evaluating a single point in time. We can get that wrong every single time. We're evaluating over time. So we evaluate those fruits, that walk, that lifestyle over time. Is there evidence of good fruit being conformed to the image of Christ here's another way to look at it that I've, I've always found to be a good example and I know you guys have heard it before if you were put on trial and you were charged with being a Christian this is all too real in some parts of the world you were put on trial for being a Christian would there be enough evidence to convict you I hope so. But he compares it to fruit on a tree. You wouldn't look at a tree that was full of fruit that was gnarled and misshapen and rotten and everything else and conclude, well, that must be a healthy tree. At the same time, you wouldn't look at a tree that was full of just this beautiful, delicious, great smelling fruit and conclude that tree must be bad. Those things don't make sense. And that's what Jesus is keying on here. We, we're not called as Christians to be judgmental. We've talked about this. But we are called to be discerning. We're told that we can know something about a person. And their salvation by their fruits. If someone's life is characterized by bad fruit or it lacks good fruit that person is probably not saved every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire we owe it to ourselves to examine ourselves our fruit because jesus warns us that those who do not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. At the same time, as, as we talk along these lines, it's important to remember here, fruit is evidence of salvation. It's not the means of salvation. It goes on in verse 21. This is our text this morning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name 
and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I'm forced to ask this morning, keeping in mind everyone who might be listening to this message, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church? Is it because your, your family always has? You know, you can go back 30 or 40 years and the answer might have been, well, it's good business networking. It's a way to have community influence. It's what's expected of upstanding members of the community. Maybe you just say, it makes me feel good. This passage screams so loudly to me as a pastor, as a word of warning to the modern American church. This message for everyone who hears it should make you wake up. Wake up. This is scary. This is a warning. This is a big warning. When the many here tell Jesus that they did many good and miraculous works in his name, Jesus' response is not to argue with them and tell them, no, you didn't do all that stuff. That's not what he does. These people are doing, they are doing and doing and doing. And yet, they are rejected from heaven. They're rejected from heaven. Perhaps the greatest warning to people in Christian churches today, and this is especially true, I think, in small towns like this, where maybe your parents or your grandparents founded the church. Uh, traditions here run strong. This is part of what we do in life. And many of us can be so busy when it comes to the church. We serve on committees. We pay our tithes. We're, we're here whenever the door is open. All of those things are good. All those things are great. But they are not going to get you into heaven. We can be religious all the way to hell. All the way to hell. Our good works cannot be divorced from a real and dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. But neither will resting in our relationship with Christ mean that we will be devoid of action. James chapter 1 verse 22, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Jesus in John thirteen seven. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 1 John 2, 3 and 4, and by this we know that we have come to know him. This is how we know we've come to know him. If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You cannot save yourself by anything you do apart from Christ. Neither can you truly belong to Christ and not seek to do God's will. Does that mean that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have to do any of this stuff? No. It means that if you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, your life will be characterized by doing as he commands and learning and growing more each day in your understanding of what that means. 
Hebrews 12, 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Donald Whitney, speaking about this, says, without holiness, that is Christ-likeness or godliness, no one will see the Lord. That's what our verse said. Regardless of how many times they've been to church or how often they've been engaged in religious activities or how spiritual they believe themselves to be. Truly believing God's word and truly trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation sparks a response. The Holy Spirit's presence in your life guarantees it. To follow in Jesus' path, we must not only hear the word, we must do it. We must act according to it. This is how we grow in holiness, in Christ-likeness. But you can't counterfeit your relationship with Christ by putting those things on. Some people may intentionally do churchy things to check boxes, to make themselves feel good. Look at me and how righteous I am. I go to church, I give them money. Uh, you know, whenever there's that one dish at potluck that nobody's eating, I'll go take a spoonful so that person doesn't feel bad. Some people are just deceiving themselves. I'm more righteous than they are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mess up sometimes, but look at what that lady did. But I fear that a lot of people may simply not understand that being busy with church is no substitute for that all-important saving relationship with Christ. We can get caught up in the importance of our busyness like Martha in Luke 10 instead of focusing on Jesus like her sister Mary did. And we'll go on trying to do enough to get into heaven, thinking that if we can just be a little busier, maybe we'll be okay. If we can just be nicer to people, then maybe God's cosmic judgment scales are going to somehow weigh in our favor. Maybe hoping, but never really feeling assured that our eternal life is secured because without Jesus it is not. Jesus is the narrow gate. He's the only path to eternal life. God is glorified when we give our lives as sacrifices to Jesus, placing all of our trust and hope in him for salvation, loving him as a savior, yes, obeying him as Lord. Verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. This part of his warning, it might refer to the, the storms of, of life that come and go for each of us. Uh, and our faith will certainly not withstand those trials if it's not rooted in a relationship with Christ. When somebody's faith withers in difficulty like that, either it wasn't rooted in Jesus to begin with, it was rooted in man or, or a false teaching, or at the very least, that believer needs to cry out to God for more faith, and he'll give it. He'll supply it. But more likely, what Jesus is warning about here is talking about final judgment. And it's important to remember, I was talking about who all is listening to this message. Jesus here is not comparing people who call themselves Christians with everybody else in the world. It's not what he's doing. If you're listening to this message this morning and you don't call yourself a Christian, you are still on the broad road. And I pray that you will start looking for that narrow gate to exit. And all I can say to you is look around at the signs you see on this highway that you're on. Where do you think those signs are pointing you? 
Where do you think this road is taking you? Look for the exit to the road that leads to peace and order and life. That's the road you want to be on. But Jesus here in this warning is speaking only to people who call themselves his followers. He's speaking to people who call themselves Christians. And he's distinguishing between those who hear him and obey and those who have taken his name in vain because they have no relationship with him and they do not hear and obey. Why is he sharing this word of warning with that group of people? Because he wants to wake those people up before the broad road runs out. When that broad road runs out, they will meet a very unexpected destination. Hell. No, Jesus says, you are only wise if you hear my words and obey. It's not enough to hear Jesus' words. And by the way, those are God's words. It's not enough to hear them and think they sound like a, a nice kind of person to be. It's not enough to hear them and file them away as having some truth that might come in handy sometime. It's not enough to hear Jesus speak and simply choose to add bits and pieces of Christianity to your life like just another pretty accessory that goes with everything else that you put on each day. Have you heard Jesus' words but haven't obeyed him? Do you think you entered through the narrow gate? but have lived your life since then going with the flow of traffic on the broad road. And as I reflected on those questions, the thought popped into my head, hearing the gospel is dangerous. Hearing the gospel is dangerous. For some That might mean hearing other gospels like the prosperity gospel. And the danger is thinking that you've heard the gospel and then deciding that the gospel has failed when that false gospel inevitably does. But even with the real gospel message of Jesus Christ, the danger is in hearing it. And for some of us, maybe over and over and over again in church that we grew up in and that we keep attending because that's what we do. And we hear it over and over and over again and not responding. Our hearts harden just a little bit more every time we hear it and don't respond. Or maybe you think you've accepted Jesus when you haven't. That's the one that when you ask him, when did you become a Christian, says, well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You may just be going through the motions. You may have convinced yourself that you're a Christian, but you don't know Christ. You're playing church. You're playing Christian. Have you trusted in what you want to be true in your sinfulness and with your deceitful heart? Have you trusted in what you want to be true and not in what God has told you is true in his word? If so, you don't know Jesus. And more importantly, he doesn't know you. You have no firm foundation. You have built your house upon the sand and it will not stand If you reject him as Lord of your life now, he's not going to force you to accept him as Lord for eternity. You will not inherit eternal life with God. You will suffer in hell. When judgment comes, as it will for all of us, 
the only one who has heard Jesus and obeyed will withstand God's judgment and be welcomed into eternal life in the presence of God. And this is how Jesus wraps up the Sermon on the Mount, or how Matthew wraps up his retelling of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Scribes taught lessons like scholars, uh, you know, like people who were well, like me, for that matter, where we're going in and we're trying to, you know, read what God's word says. And I'm going to try to tell you about it and explain it to you. Jesus speaks truth in power. Why? Because he's got authority. Jesus has authority. He assumes the role of judge in this passage. I don't know if you caught that or not. Be gone from me. I never knew you. The listeners would have expected that judgment to be given from God. But neither Jesus nor Matthew feel that they need to justify this claim. Jesus warrants listening to because he is God. And that is precisely why Jesus' final warning in the Sermon on the Mount is so critical for us to hear. We may want the truth to be one thing, but God has given us the truth through his word and especially through his son. This is God's word to us coming from the son who's just told us what the Christian life looks like. That the path to salvation must be entered through the narrow gate of Jesus and that the hard way of obedience must be the path we follow. We can hear it all day long and never take it to heart. Never give our lives to him. Never express our love for him through our obedience to his word. We are called to go through the narrow gate, yes, but the gate is just the beginning. It's not the end. We're also called to walk the narrow path that path, again, that is only wide enough to allow for Jesus' footsteps. And we are not to wander from the path to the right or to the left. It's a hard way. It requires work and obedience. Not for salvation, but in response to salvation. As evidence of salvation, and better yet, as your assurance of salvation. And Jesus' way leads to life. Now in abundance and in joyful, grace-filled eternity to come. Wake up. and Make sure that you've built your house upon the rock, the cornerstone, the only firm foundation of truth. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know this is a hard word this morning. I pray that those people who needed to hear it, that need to wake up, that you would bring them to hear this message, more importantly, to hear your word and what you have to say. And Father, I am so thankful that you love us enough to give us this word of warning, to, to try over and over again in some of our cases to wake us up to point us to Jesus Christ, to remind us what he did, to show us what's available to us through him, to tell us exactly what you want for us and what you expect from us. Father, we ignore that at our own peril. But Lord, I do pray that this morning we would be woken up. Lord, if, if somebody has heard this message this morning that does not even call themselves a Christian, I pray that they would not put it off any longer. That you would pray right now, tell God, God, you are right about who you say I am. I am a sinner and I am in need of a savior. Lord, I give my life to Jesus Christ because I know that he died for my sins. You tell God that right now. Then you are walking through that narrow gate. Find a church to help you stay 
on the hard path. If you are attending church right now and some of that just stepped on your toes a little bit too much, I pray you would honestly evaluate yourself, your heart, your relationship with Jesus Christ. If it needs to be renewed, renew it. If you don't have it, get it. Find it. Call out to God and tell Him you want Jesus. You want to give your life to Him. You want Him in yours. And if you are a Christian that's just saying amen, and you can truthfully look at yourself in the mirror and say, I see that fruit. I know I'm a Christian even though I still mess up. I know I'm a Christian who has been given forgiveness because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. Then I pray this word of warning this morning would wake you up for everybody else in your life that doesn't have it. We can be so tempted sometimes to play patty cake, play footsies with people that don't know Jesus. We're so worried about offending people and being nice to them that we won't speak the truth that will save their lives. Father, give us that boldness and encouragement that we need to do it. Lord, I thank you for the hard messages. I thank you for a church that's willing to hear them. Father, I thank you for people that are here that want to share the gospel and wake people up to a saved life. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. That's about it for us this morning. I don't know how much voice I have left. A couple, uh, couple of announcements for you guys before I send you on your way. Are we collecting offering on the way out, or did you already get it? Are we good? All right. Just in case anybody missed it, if you need to drop off offering, Dan will be over here to collect it from you on your way out. Next Sunday, August 9th, we will be having service just that Sunday back in the sanctuary. The reason we are doing that is because we have a baptism for Lincoln. Amen? You know, I didn't get a single amen through that sermon. I hope that was because you guys were riveted. I don't know. Um... Lincoln will be getting baptized on August 9th. Lincoln has chosen the narrow gate, right? And we as fellow Christians are going to pledge at the same time to help him as he starts down that hard path that he's on for the rest of his life now. I pray that he will have a good church to help him do that. The following Sunday, the 16th, we will be back out here in the parking lot, okay? Um... For all intents and purposes, just by, by means of making a, a housekeeping statement here, let's just go ahead and consider every Sunday to be a drive-in service for the foreseeable future unless you hear otherwise, okay? So we'll keep posting stuff. We'll keep letting you know anyway, but let's just assume it's going to be outside unless you hear something else. So guys, I, I hope that that message was something you could take to heart and use somewhere in your life. Um, either to grow closer to Christ yourself or to bring somebody else that needs to hear it closer to him as well. So guys, take that. Think about it over lunch. Let it change you and who you are. Go with God today, guys. I'm so appreciative for y'all. I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.